Hi everyone, Luca from LucasGisbertPhotography.com and in this video I'm just going to give you kind of a guide through of what I'm taking with me at weddings and once I've done this I'm going to go into each separate stage of the wedding to let you know what gear I'm using. Um, the first uh, single story I like to say is that there isn't really any perfect gear, uh, perfect gear for weddings. Everyone has his own style and once you kind of find your own style you then buy what's make it work. Uh, so for me this is what works and for me this is what is best for my kind of wedding photography. Uh, so let's go one by one. So first of all the bodies. I use Nikon. Um, I don't, I'm not a Canon user but I do very much respect Canon. I love what I do but I'm just a Nikon user because I've started with Nikon and just kept going. Uh, I use two D800, one which I'm filming on now and one which is there. Uh, they don't really work as backup, they more work as a team. So I will have probably maybe one lens on one and one lens on the other. And this allows you to be quicker if you want to use prime, but also if something goes wrong with one of the cameras, <coughs> you can have a second one. Uh, if you are looking to get into wedding photography, do not start a wedding with one camera. This is very risky. Uh, you should always have a minimum of two, uh, two cameras. Uh, wedding gear is not about what you have, it's more about your backup because if something goes wrong, you have something to make it up. Uh, so these are the bodies, so two Nikon D800. <coughs> now, lenses, I use uh, zoom lens and I use prime lens. Uh, and I will come back to this later why I use which one in which situation. So zoom lens, I have a Nikon 70-200 to uh, VR2. Uh, this is uh, a great lens. I will put the link here so you can have a look at the, the full review I've done. I've got a Nikon 24 to 70, which I'm filming on now. So I've actually used my mug cup uh, just to kind of, so there is no blank. Uh, you can see exactly why I have. So Nikon 24 70, it's, it's a good lens, <coughs> but I'll come back to this again later. I've not done a review for this and there is a reason for that. Uh, I've got another zoom lens, which is a wide lens, which is the Tokina 16 to 28 millimeter. Now the Tokina has uh, great optics, problem with flares, but uh, it really gives you a nice and wide range with very, very sharp shots. And it goes down to uh, 2.8, which is great. You see if you're shooting indoor, I will again put uh, <coughs> the review right over there. Prime lenses, I have a 60 millimeter Nikon uh, 2.8 macro. So this is obviously used for the details and ring shots. I've got my beloved Sigma 35mm f1.4, which is uh, one of my favorite lens of all. I have a Nikon 85mm f1.8. Uh, now this has re recently replaced my Sigma 85mm f1.4. Uh, if you haven't seen my review, I've put the post uh, here so you can go and have a look at it. And I've got this 50mm Nikon F1.4G. <coughs> so these are pretty much all the lens and body I use. Now for the lighting, I use two SB900. Uh, I used to have uh, an extra three Young Neos, uh, just in case something goes wrong or if I needed to uh, bring more light, but I just realized that I don't. I rarely use more than two speed lights. Uh, I use the Pixel King Pro uh, as triggers uh, and I use the ice light as continuous light and I am looking uh, to get another uh, video light for it. Now the ice light is not inside, it's actually uh, lighting me right now. <coughs> and I have a memory card, uh, quite a lot of it and I only use Sandy's Extreme. Extreme. And the reason for that is because, well, I've never had a problem with it. Uh, always worked well, just uh, just fine. Um, I had problem with Kensington when I started. I, I was using them because they were cheaper, <coughs> with quite good speed, but actually they were very slow and very unreliable. I had problem with them. Sandisk are by far my favorite brand. Uh, I know Lexa makes some great cars, but I've not used them. I'm happy with Sandisk, so I stick with Sandisk. So that is pretty much uh, the main gear. And I'm not going through the, all the accessories I'm taking with me, but this is really the main gear I take for me. So 
So what I now like to do is to go through each uh, section and kind of show you also some picture after each section of uh, <clears throat> what I've taken and with what. So it give you an idea of uh, how I kind of break down my day when I look at equipment. So let's have a look at the preparation. Right, so you uh, arriving at the preparation. And the preparation is extremely important and not only for picture wise but also for uh, getting a connection with the uh, bride, groom and all the guests because what's happening is when you arrive at the preparation that's the first time you're actually coming into their wedding and when you arrive you've got to well make yourself know you're the photographer you may be meeting you will probably be meeting people you haven't met before like the bridesmaid maybe the, the best man the, the mother of the bride the parents the, the uncles and all this because uh, lots of time there is quite a lot of crowd in getting prepared and it's for you to kind of get in get yourself known with other people and just blend in the in the background because you don't really want to be interacting too much with what's happening they're normally quite a bit stressed out they want to be on time there is lots of things going on there is a hairdresser there there is a makeup artist and it goes on and on so what i try to do is try to avoid and coming with bags of equipment my 70 to 200 and i try to come in first kind of introduce myself uh, to the people I don't know, and then just let them do what they do. And from there, I normally have my bag, which have most of my equipment, but this is pretty much the main kit I will be using. So the 7200 will not be used. And the reason for that is because when you are getting ready, when they are getting ready, you normally work in kind of a restricted spaces. And a lot of time is maybe an hotel room, and you can't really, um, you don't want to take too much space there. You just want to really be blending in the back, get your job done, kind of reporting, you know, documenting what's happening with obviously getting some good shots, but um, you really want to let them do what they do. And for this, uh, obviously I use my Nikon D800. Uh, I have always one flash on just in case, and it's not always on or off, uh, depending on the situation. I will use the Tokina 16 to 20 this is normally the first lens I use. And the reason for that is because I like to get uh, a feel for the whole what's happening here. So I normally stick uh, my D this on my D800, get a few shots of the room of what's happening, and then after take it off. Once I've done this, I will normally move to the 35 millimeter. Now the 35 millimeter 1.4 Sigma is a great lens uh, for the preparation because it's wide enough. A 35 millimeter will give you a good coverage. And as long as the room is not really small, that should actually be fine. And you should be able to get some really, really cool shots, uh, especially at 1.4. So that is probably my, one of my most used lens uh, for it. Uh, I will put a couple of pictures once I finish this uh, to show you the shots I've taken during the preparation using this equipment. Uh, after that, I have the uh, 50mm f1.4. This is one of the lenses I rarely use, and I use it a lot for detail shots. So for my take picture of the bokeh, 50mm gives me that kind of um, eye view, and I, that's what I don't like about it. Uh, a lot of people love 50mm. I'm kind of against 50mm. Uh, I'm for something that you don't see every day. And for me, 50 millimeter, I, I, I just find it a bit boring. Uh, so that kind of stay in a bag, rarely used it, but it's always there. The 85 millimeter also is a good thing. And I think the 85 millimeter is used once I've got all my safe shot done. So for example, I've got a bride getting ready. I know that's just going on. And the thing is during the preparation, preparation normally you there for, let's say an hour, an hour and a half. And during an hour, an hour and a half, is, there is no much going on. And really, it's a great opportunity to mess around with your lenses, get some really arty shot, and do something different, and really use your creativity, because you've got time to do it. There is no much... Uh, you just have time to do it. Uh, if you come there and try to get a job quickly done, well, within 10 minutes you could be done, and then after you just have to wait, so I'd rather take my time and try different new things. The 60mm macro is a great lens for the preparation because you normally you can get your hands on the engagement ring. I like to take a picture of the engagement ring 
Uh, I think it's very important, it's really part of the day. Uh, and if, the, if I've not done an engagement session with the bride and groom, I would rarely have an engagement picture, uh, picture of the engagement ring. So that is always an important thing to do. Uh, after that, I uh, will... That is pretty much it, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, the only lens I don't really take is the 70 to 200, and, this, and I think it's because of the size. Uh, the 24 to 70 is not a lens I use at all, uh, very, very rarely during wedding, because again, I find the 24 to 70, which I'm filming on now, like the 50 millimeter. I just, I, I just don't find, I just don't find it interesting. I find it quite boring and plain. And I think it's a great documentary lens, reportage lens, which I'll use for reportage and trying to capture uh, what's going on and all this. But I find that with prime lenses, and uh, maybe the 16 to 28, I get the same plus extra. So working at 1.4, you can really get uh, that nice background. You can, I don't, I don't know, I just find the 2470, my 24 to 70 Nikon is my backup lens because it covers such a big area. But my prime lenses are my first choice always. So that is pretty much why I take out the preparation. I will also have the ice light uh, because I could use it for the details. But uh, I normally try to keep the, the lighting as natural as possible. If I use the flash, it's really, really lightly just to give a quick pop or maybe on the face. If needed to, always bounce, never straight on the on the person. And that is pretty much what I take for the preparation. So let me show you a few pictures I've taken. Uh, I'm not going to show a full portfolio. I'm just going to put two, three or four pictures uh, just to give you an idea of what I've taken. And then we then move on to the registry office. Right, okay, the registry office or the Mary. Uh, so that's the place where you kind of sign the paper. Uh, now this could be this other church. Now in some countries like UK, you can actually do the paperwork in a church, so you kind of bypass this. In France, you can't. You have to go to the registry office and then you go to the church to do it. So we're gonna do both of them. So, um, so the registry office is a very, very reporter style uh, event kind of pass and the reason for that is because you just don't know what's going to happen you're going to be dealing with uh, photos you need to take which are which could be close which you could be far uh, because when you arrive there you're probably going to be spending some time outside with the guests waiting for the bride and groom to arrive so the way, the way i normally do it is normally leave half an hour before the bride is about to leave the the the, the car as soon as i've got a picture of her uh, in a in a dress uh, maybe with the mother, then I move on and get to the uh, registry office. And just for the, and in that uh, time when I arrived, it's 30 minutes in advance, I can kind of start meeting with the people. I always try to have a chat with them, see how they are, uh, kind of introduce myself. And you, it's good to let yourself know, you know, give a card or two here and there. And then at least um, they know you are the official photographer and uh, you, you kind of, come across nicely, you know, you, they see you as someone nice because you come, you introduce yourself, you have a chat with them. And it's very important to try to create connection, not just with the bride and groom, but with all the guests there. I mean, as many as you can. And the reason for that is because for the bride and groom, these people as are, as are important, uh, as are extremely important. You know, they've been invited to the, one of the best days in their life. And I think that once <clears throat> you kind of create a bond with those people, you kind of get them more comfortable in front of your camera. And if you, during the day, once you're talking to them, come back to them and get pictures as they are talking, they won't really kind of feel awkward because they know you, they're talking to you, and it will just be easier. So that's my recommendation. Get there earlier and start talking to people, get a few shows together and when I arrived there, because I spent a bit of time outside, <clears throat> the first two lenses I'm going to be using are the 70-200 and the 24-70. Obviously, I'm getting on my 
do uh, two D800. So th this is when I start using two bodies, 2470, 70 to 200. And I start shooting what's happening, I can chat with other people. Um, once I kind of feel like I've covered a bit, I will normally take off the 70 to 200 and put the 85 millimeter on. Then I will take off the 24 to 70 and put the 16 to 28 on. 16 to 28 will give me wide shot and I like to take shot from the top so you can get a nice wide of what's happening, how many people are here. 85 millimeter gives me that extra reach and this is where you can get some uh, nice and cool portrait from people which are a bit far. Uh, I like to go around kids, take kids together with the 85 with single portraits. You can actually go around and take portraits, beautiful portraits of people and that is really good, uh, especially if you can spot uh, who are uh, the close family there because when the bride and groom go through the pictures and you can see beautiful portrait during uh, of the uncle, the grandparents, uh, they will appreciate that. So that's quite important. And that's why I move from 70 to 124 to 70 to those two. Once we get into inside the registry office, um, this is where it gets a bit tricky because I, again, I like to kind of get creative, but the problem in the registry office in Mary, you just don't want to make too much noise. Uh, it's normally very quiet. There is only the Maya or speaking or the uh, registrar. And well, if you make noise, just also the noise of the shutter is sometimes a bit disturbing. I, when I am at D3, it was, or D3 S even, it was a nightmare because the thing was like a hammer on, onto a metal board. Uh, as the atom is a bit more quiet, but changing lights is a bit of a pain. So here, this is where I switch back to the 2470 and the 70 to 200. Um, <clears throat> uh, because obviously they give me that wide focal length from 24 to 200 without moving any lenses. And this is where you have to, you know, kind of respect what's happening there and work as much as you can with what you have. The registry office and the Mary doesn't go on for too long. Um, a lot of time I will also try to move the 2470 and bring the 16 to 28 towards the end. And the reason for that is because once they've uh, uh, given the rings, once they have uh, sent the paper, everything can relax a bit. And this is where the nose kind of normally goes up a little. So that's when I take my 2470 and put on the 16 to 28 to get a nice wide shot of the whole room. Uh, if I had this from the beginning, this may kind of restrict me in what I want to do and it may be a bit too wide. Now with the D800, you could probably say, yes, you could crop, but I'd rather try to get it right for the first time. Now, once this is done, this is where my 35 and 85 goes on. Uh, I've got a safe shot, everything is safe. I've taken uh, good reportage pictures, I've taken them signing the registry, uh, holding hands, so on, so on, maybe a first kiss. Sometimes they do a first kiss in the registry office, sometimes they don't, uh, but you have to be prepared for anything. So this is where 70 to 200 will always be there, or 24 to 70, depending on what you're trying to get. Once I've got my safe shot done, I go on to the 35 and the 85. One on each lens, and then start playing around, because when you play with 1.4 lenses, you can really, or 1.8, you can start getting different things, and this is where your lens selection is quite important. Uh, 24 70. If I was working with a DX camera, like a from my old D300S, um, I can promise you, you will not see much difference between taking photos with an 18 to 55 and then 24 to 70 on an FX. And yeah, maybe people may be screaming at what I'm saying here, but. The, the choice of lenses you are doing is very important. I've taken some incredible shot with an 18 to 55, which cost, I don't know, 70 bucks maybe, 70 euros. Uh, 2470 is a 1500 quid lens. Uh, but I can tell you, this difference between these two lenses is no that much in, in regard to sharpness. And yes, it is different. It's definitely different in build quality and all this. But when you look at picture, because that's what's important, is the picture you come out with. Well, I can tell you that you won't see much difference. So lens selection is extremely important and choosing prime with wide aperture will give you something different than what you see from a compact camera or a normal camera. Uh, 
2470, I just, I just find it personally a bit blend. Uh, it's really my least used lens at weddings. Um, and that is for, for this reason. Great reportage if you need to be quick, but if you want to take your time and good something good, uh, it's not a great lens. Now, so uh, once we've done this, we move on to the church. The church is pretty much the same uh, kit I'm using here. The, the Tokina will be great because you can get a great picture inside the church. Um, <clears throat> the 35 and 85 will not be used as much here. So my most used lens in the church will be the Tokina 16 to 28 and the uh, 70 to 200. And the reason for this two extreme is because, I mean extreme, no extreme, but 16 to 28 you can get a lot in there, 70 to 200 you can get closer. And in the church, this is pretty much what's happening. You are never very close to it and you are never too far from it. So 16 to 28, you can get a good uh, picture of the old church. 70 to 200 will help you maybe with the first case, capturing uh, pieces of the crowd. So far, but if you get uh, at the altar or next to it and looking at the crowd, that's what I do quite a lot. And just kind of go around with your camera and try to find things that are happening. You know, someone crying, someone laughing with the kids, someone talking a bit or someone maybe sleeping, uh, it happened before. You know, kind of try to find emotions in there, try to find uh, things that are happening. Because if you keep looking at the altar where the bride and groom are, uh, you're going to get pretty bored very quickly because they are pretty much go up and down all the time. You don't really see their faces because they are facing the priest. Yeah, you get the first few shots, but then you have to move on quickly and try to find other shots that are a bit more interesting because you could get the, the church shot if you look at the bride and go within a couple of minutes. Uh, obviously, you want to get the first kiss. Apart from this, it's hard to get very creative because you are kind of restricted in where you can go. There is areas where you're not allowed to go. You have to respect the church, you know. You can't just go up the altar and start pulling your camera around. Uh, if you know the priest, you, you may be able to get a shot like this. But uh, <clears throat> I would not recommend you just try to do this alone uh, without asking or without warning what you want to do before. Um, and again, is I try to blend in. I don't like to be the center of attention and to go on the altar and try to do all different things. I, I just prefer to blend in and really kind of get people to forget me. And that's how I get my work done. So yeah, the church 70 to 200 and 24 to 70 are the best for me, uh, 16 to 28. When the bride and groom are coming out of the church, the 16 to 28 is great. Uh, I also sometimes, sometimes try to get up and get them to come out like this. Uh, this is where you can get your group shot done sometime. I uh, normally try to get all my group shot done with the 70 to 200 to get a nice compression. Uh, I just, uh, for me, is the best lens for group shots. And once we get outside, this is when the 1628 kind of works well because everyone is around uh, <clears throat> and you kind of try to get as much as you can in the picture and get close to it. You want to get close to the action and this is where you can really get in uh, and start shooting wide and normally you get good results. So that is pretty much yeah, the registry office and the, the church. Right, okay, so the registry office and the church, I kind of put it together because it's one or the other and sometimes you do one after the other very quickly and it's pretty much the same gear close to it. Now, going on to, let's say, the, the session, a lot of time, uh, depending where you are, what country you're shooting, you will have the kind of candid shots after that, between now and the cocktail or the dinner. Now. For the candy shot, I use uh, normally 1D800 because we have time. We normally have time. Uh, even if we are short on time, I'd rather just to carry one camera around. Um, having two cameras is really when is a necessity. So obviously this is where the lighting can sort of come into place. I've got my uh, 2SB900, which I would normally use. And I would have my Pixel King to trigger them because I never use it 
on camera is always off camera flash. Then I will use my 85 mm 1.8, my 35 mm 1.4, and my 70 to 200. These are my pretty much only used lens uh, when I do candy shot. I do sometimes go on to the 16 to 28, and I'm starting to try to get a signature shot where I have both of them looking in one way, and I do a shot of the back just to kind of remind them where they were, and I think it's quite a nice touch to do it. Is um, so normally light them from the back. It's really them to looking, and I try to get the best landscape around, and I bring my landscape skills and try to go landscape with them in the middle. And uh, it's normally something different, you know. I even put my aperture up to about 11 or even 14 or 16. Really, kind of true. Like if you were doing a landscape, but you kind of put the bride and groom looking at the landscape in the picture, is uh, one of the picture I really like to do. Uh, but the 85 millimeter is uh, a good lens. I really, really like it. You just have to be very careful with your depth of field. Uh, Sometimes, uh, if you have the bride and groom with a bit of a distance, and you are shooting them, and you can see there is a there is a problem. You can't really even put them. One way to do it is kind of tilt your camera this way because what's happening is your focus pan is going to move like this. So that's one way to get a good effect as well. Where sometimes you have one person which is, let's say, <coughs> over here, and you got the other one which is over here. So there is a bit of distance. Now you could get this one to go forward or this one to go backwards. But sometimes it's just easier to just tilt to be your camera. So your focus pan is then this way. And you can then uh, shoot. This is normally the way I work. So for example, if uh, I'm shooting and I can see there is maybe uh, maybe he's a bit in focus, I'm uh, just going to move like this, move a little, and then I've got both of them in focus. That's one of the way I uh, kind of fix this. Uh, but the 1.8 is great. It's really, really nice. I love it. Uh, the only thing is that my 70 to 200, I just love the compression I get from it. And in lots of situations, it will depend on the background and what I'm trying to achieve. The difference in bokeh between 85 1.8 and 70 to 200 at 200, well, I would probably say maybe the 70 to 200 will have possibly a better bokeh because the, the focal length is much higher, especially if you shoot at 200. You get such a compression, so what's happening in the background is kind of grow. Uh, as an 85, it will stay pretty much normal. So I will kind of judge on the situation, on the background, on the lighting, and see exactly what effect I want to get. But these are kind of my main uh, use lens. The 35 mm, I just love the kind of portrait effect you get on people, uh, especially shooting copper at 1.4. Again, 1.4, you get beautiful background, and in lots of circumstances, the 35 will, again, give you something a bit spicy, something a bit different. And that's what you want to do really, is get off the normal. If you go and do the uh, candy shots with 2470, oh, I can't even imagine how boring the picture would be. I mean, it is a lot about what's happening around them, about their expression. Fair enough, I totally agree with this. But as a professional wedding photographer these days, you just can't go with normal. If you go with normal, you get left behind. and. You really have to come up with something a bit more different. Is that the thing? Is if you shoot with a 24 to 70, the guest that's next to you is taking a little shot here and there could exactly get the same result. As simple as that. Uh, yes, you have the posing, the lighting, and all this, which is extremely important. But the choice of lenses is as important as choosing this because a wrong lens in a good situation will give you a picture which is not as great. So that is pretty much the. the the lenses and flashes I use. Uh, I normally try to do two candid sessions, it's the one there and one at night. And one at night is really where I kind of play with lighting. And this is one of my favorite time of the wedding is when it gets dark because you really get to play with, um, this is like what I call a geeky time where you can bring your flashes, your wireless trigger, your ice light, play with the background lights, with motions, and it's really lots of things going on at night. And I find it much easier, not much easier, but much more interesting. And really something that kind of defines as well my work is that I love working at night, and a lot of people don't. 
and I don't mind bringing my ISO up with that camera. I can push it to 6,400 and get incredible clean shots. Um, sometimes you have to downsize it a bit, but it's not a problem to bring your ISO up these days. Uh, so yeah, that is pretty much it. Um, so if we move on to the dinner and cocktail, So dinner and cocktail, right. Uh, so this is the time to kind of relax a bit. Uh, up to there, you've been 150% really running around and you can of have, <coughs> you can relax. Everyone's relaxing, eating. Well, I don't normally take pictures when people are eating. So normally I try to capture, first of all, the details on the table. Then I try to do this before the meal. Uh, the the cutlery, maybe the, the the wedding rings at this time. This as soon as they got they exchange the ring, this is when you can start uh, getting the rings of them and take a shot. I normally kind of scout the location and try to give me some ideas of what I'm going to do with the rings. Uh, I normally have an idea, and this my idea will normally be on the people, on my clients, because if my clients say they are a fan of Star Wars and they're going to have Star Wars Saber to cut the cake. Well, I'm gonna go with a Star Wars theme for the for the rings, like this one. Uh, if they tell me if they love flowers, it's gonna be flowers. And this is what I'm trying to do, is trying to fit the ring shot to them. If they I can see they're quite they love luxury, well I will try to bring something a bit sparkly and <coughs> make uh, something different. And that's the way normally I do the ring shots. Uh, so as I'm working around, and I normally this is when the time I do the ring shot is, I kind of scout to find a place uh, to do the ring shots. And I may find a place and come back later on, to, but at least I have an idea. And the thing you don't want to do is forget about it. Uh, it. It did happen to me to forget to do the ring shots. And my assistant actually told me, whoa, we haven't done the ring shot. We had to come back. Uh, it just happens, you know, it's a long day and this is when you, you know, it's, you know, at the end of the season, you're tired and mistakes happen, you know, no one's perfect. Uh, so you just have to make sure you get your safe shot done and ring shot is one of them. So, yeah, uh, dinner party, 70 to 200, 24, 70. Um, no, actually, no, I don't use 24, 70. 35, 14, 85, 14 are normally on my camera because it's getting low light. 70 to 200, I will use it sometime. If I, for example, need to get some picture of the speeches and they are quite far ahead and I can't get that close, this is where my 70 to 200 goes on to it. Uh, apart from this lighting was, the problem is with lighting is that you want to keep the atmosphere, the light of the atmosphere, because if you flash that, you could really lose everything and have a very blank pictures. So I normally have a flash on the, on the two cameras but I use it very, very um, specifically. It's on, but it's always off. And when I think that there is a problem using the, the ambient light there is in the room, <clears throat> this is where I bring the flash in, but I'm very, very careful on using it because I don't want to lose the atmosphere. There is nothing worse than uh, a picture of a table and it's white and everything around is black. That is not what I'm looking to do. I'm looking to keep the ambient as much as I can to bring the kind of get more texture to the light and really uh, get something beautiful. And the light sometimes works in, but you have to work in manual. If you work in TTL, this is going to be all over the show. I just don't work in TTL or automatic mode at all. <clears throat> so that is pretty much what I do for dinner. And from there, well, it's... This is where it gets really your, well, this is what I call my arty time. And I bring normally yeah, my 35, my 85, uh, what do I do? The 60 macro sometimes, sometimes the 50. And this is where I don't really know what I'm gonna use. I just use the lens as 
the time goes and as I find an opportunity. Uh, what's important for me is that if I find a shot I want to do is that I have the equipment for it. And this is why I have a quite good selection of lenses is because, <clears throat> well, with everything I have, I've, I've, I don't come across any situation anymore where I want to get a shot and I can't get it done because I don't have the piece of equipment I need. Now I kind of have very, very, very much everything I need to do pretty much anything I need. And it probably I will come to a situation where mm, actually I will need a 300 millimeter to do this or uh, a tilt shift lens. Yeah, a tilt shift lens or a fisheye. Uh, probably not because I used to have a fisheye, didn't really like it. But a tilt shift lens, I love to have this. You know, it's quite a big expenses for the amount of views I'm going to have. But it's, um, <clears throat> it's something that could be quite interesting. Uh, but so really your lens selection should be on your style, but also what you need and know what you want, because otherwise you're going to be spending crazy amount of money. But that is pretty much the everything I use. So if you have any question about um, the equipment I use, I think I've got a review on pretty much everything. Uh, I have put them on the, at the beginning of the video, so just go back to it if you want to have a look at the specific review. Uh, there are certain lenses I've not done a review for it, which is 24-70 and the 50mm. <clears throat> the reason is because I don't particularly like them and I think it will be unfair for me to do a review on a lens I don't really like because I just won't be doing a proper review and uh, I kind of like to get personal with my equipment. <laughs> I mean, when I'm in personal with my equipment, um, it, it kind of provides me emotions when I shoot. Uh, the 2470 doesn't. The 50mm, I, I just don't get it. It's, it's just not me. And this is why I don't do these reviews, is because I don't want to put a lens down with someone who's going to love it. So uh, I'd rather not do it. Uh, but if you have any question about the equipment I use, or maybe the way I organize my day, or any other question, please let me know and don't forget to uh, subscribe and join the Facebook group. Cheers, see ya. Hi, thanks for watching this video. I uh, just wanted to let you know about our Facebook group, which is uh, growing and uh, what's happening in this group. We discuss a lot of things about new products, but also give tips uh, to each other about uh, photography. So pretty much anything from uh, focusing tip to uh, maybe the Brunizer method or other things like that. Uh, the thing which is quite interesting is I'm kind of setting up some competitions there. Uh, kind of warming up a better group, but it will be some giveaway uh, provided by our sponsors that's been agreed. Uh, I just want the group to be growing and so we can have more content and uh, more uh, people to get this competition sorted. But it's a great group just to have a conversation with other photographers, meet other people from other parts of the world. So come and join us. I put the link down below. And yeah, that's pretty much it. It's really cool. There is no <coughs> rules or just be yourself and uh, have fun. Cheers, see ya.